Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, let me just start with the case first, and then uh, and then we'll go how it goes. It's a slightly longish presentation. I'll try and finish as soon as I can. So a 32-year-old uh, healthy male uh, admitted with uh, admitted to surgical ICU. Admitted to surgical ICU after a car accident with multiple uh, fractures. Three days after the admission, patient had fever, cough, and purulent uh, sputum with worsening dyspnea. And chest X-ray showed extensive infiltrates on the right upper lobe. Okay. So I mean, just keep this in mind. It's a scenario. A second case scenario. A 72-year-old uh, patient who is a known case of COPD and diabetes on treatment, uh, complaints of fever, cough, breathing difficulty. He had a little background history. He had history of uh, traumatic paraparesis. Two months ago, he was tracheostomized in view of difficult weaning. He was being fed through the Riles tube in a care facility, in a geriatric care facility. After almost prolonged uh, uh, hospitalization, he was discharged recently. So the current episode is is a, is a fairly another episode again. Okay, do you think this this what they're presenting is a community acquired pneumonia, HAP, CAP, a whole lot of terminology is there, right? VAP, HCAP. Okay, so that brings to my topic today: a multi drug resistant pneumonia. First, I think this is our first academic session in New Year, so Happy New Year, everybody! Am I audible to everyone? Happy New Year, sir. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So okay. today my topic is multi-drug resistant pneumonia. Okay. So what do you mean by multi-drug resistance? Uh, I will uh, explain few terminologies. All right. So when you say multi-drug resistant, this is a, this is an MCQ question. So if anybody wants to answer, can answer. Okay. So. Uh, what do you mean by multi-drug resistance? Acquired non-susceptibility. There are a lot of terminologies which, which I want to explain as we go. We will try and get an understanding of what these actually mean. Okay. Some organisms or some uh, antibiotics are intrinsically resistant to uh, some, some organisms, right? Like example, uh, enterococcus, they're uh, resistant to cephalosporins. Colistin, uh, its resistance to Proteus, uh, Providentia, Morganella, all those things. Okay. So when I here mean acquired non susceptibility, that means at some point it was susceptible. It became non susceptible. Okay. So that is what you call as acquired non susceptibility. At any point you all have doubt, just uh, message in chat or you interrupt me, please. Okay. So when you say MDR, it is acquired non-susceptible, non-susceptible to one agent in three or more antibiotic classes, antimicrobial classes. Bacterial isolates should be tested against all the molecules in each classes and all of the above. Okay. So what do you think is the answer? All of the above. Okay. So going next. Why do we know, need to know about MDR? Mainly because of the th threat to therapeutics, prolonged illness, high medical cost, early target for immunocompromised conditions, uh, de decreased effectiveness for the other drugs, high mortality. I mean, it just gets difficult and the increase in burden in the healthcare. This is another question. Which of the following statements about ESBL is not true? Uh, what is ESBL? Extended spectrum beta lactamases. So extended spectrum beta lactamases are most often plasmid mediated. They are generally derived from TEM or SHU enzymes. Enzymes hydrolyze penicillin, rod spectrum, uh, cephalosporins and monobactams. They confer resistance to all third generation cephalosporins. And carbovenems are the drug of choice for ESBL organisms. Cephalosporins are not used. So, uh, so the answer is A, B, and C. I'll slightly explain why. I mean, quickly explain why. So, plasmid mediated. Uh, usually, ESBLs are plasmid mediated, and they're not chromosomally mediated. Okay. 
and they are usually derived from TEM and SHV enzymes predominantly at least over 140 or 150 varieties are there and they definitely hydrolyze penicillin, broad spectrum cephalosporins and monobacterins. Coming to the fourth line, they confer resistance to all third generation? No. At least one drug in third generation cephalosporins. Carbapenems are the drug of choice. Cephalosporins are not used is not true. Cephalosporins along with uh, beta lactamase inhibitors can be used in combination. Okay. So four and five are wrong. Next question. Non-susceptibility to at least, see my approach, I don't want to like present in a very detailed way. So I'm just trying to put MCQs and see if, if you know, we think. So non-susceptibility to at least one agent in all, but two or fewer antimicrobial categories. That is bacterial isolate remains susceptible to one or two categories. If you didn't understand, I'll repeat that again. That is essentially means that bacterial isolate remains susceptible to one or two categories. What does that mean? We spoke about MDR, right? Does it fit into MDR definition? I don't think so. MDR is basically at least three classes, at least one drug in each class. So here I'm telling all the classes except two that it is resistant. So this is what we call XDR, basically non-susceptibility to at least one agent in all but two or uh, two, I mean, uh, two or fewer antimicrobial classes. There's another terminology, PDR. PDR means just uh, non-susceptible to every known antimicrobial group, right? So the outline of my talk today, I will uh, uh, touch upon few terminologies like I've mentioned till now. Then I will tell you what is, I mean, outline at least, VAP, CAP, HCAP, uh, uh, all these things and a few uh, outline epidemiology about why we need to know what are the risk factors for pneumonia and especially the MDR pneumonia. How do we diagnose MDR pneumonia both clinically and uh, diagnostic uh, uh, microbiologically? What are the commonly encountered organisms in our ICU setups, both the gram positives and gram negatives? Uh, outline touch on the what are the uh, antibiotics we have at our disposal? And which of the antibiotics are used for gram positive, gram negatives, their mechanism of action with the uh, dosages and uh, very superficially, I'm going to touch all these things and the best practices to prevent the multidrug resistance. Uh, classification, what is a CAP? CAP, we all know. Okay, anything which is acquired outside the uh, hospital setting. HAP, hospital acquired pneumonia, anything at least two, hour, two days of hospitalization when no suspicion of disease incubation before hospital admission is present. Basically, patient came with some other illness altogether, came to the hospital two days in the illness, developed like our first case scenario. Next one is VAP. A hospital acquired pneumonia occurring more than 48 hours after endotracheal intubation. These terminologies are like there's a slight difference, but we, it's as a healthcare personnel, we need to understand what is what. Aspiration pneumonia. Basically, uh, inhalation of contents from the stomach or mouth into the uh, lungs. It is more of an extension of CAP and HAP. What is HCAP? HCAP is pneumonia acquired in a non-hospital care institutions. Like our second case scenario we discussed today. So this patient was in a geriatric care facility. Okay. Previous hospitalization. Okay. I will get back to that case again. So what are the risk factors? Risk factors for CAP, we know lifestyle factors, previous history of pneumonia. Uh, for hospital acquired pneumonia, uh, I don't know why male sex is predominant, but male sex is one of the described factors. Malnutrition, burns, trauma, post-surgery, uh, severe illness, ARDS, colonization. So these are all the causes for uh, uh, risk factors for HAP. Uh, more than 60 years, the geriatric population are more prone. Aspiration pneumonia, uh, impaired uh, neurological conditions, post-stroke, uh, rehabilitations during that impaired swallowing, impaired consciousness like the patient we had, same. He was fed through Riles tube aspiration. Probably there is some breathing, uh, swallowing difficulty. So there was some micro aspirations. And so what are the pathogen specific risk factors? So in this, I'm going to discuss only about MRSA. The others, uh, yes, I've just mentioned. So previous MRA in MRSA infections, residents in a nursing home or a long-term care facilities, prior hospitalization within 90 days. All right. 
then pseudomonas also if there are any pulmonary comorbidities like known bronchial asthma copd uh, yes binish brother and this are wrong it comes okay yeah then uh, enterobacteria ac also the residents in the nursing homes all right so these are all very pathogen specific risk factors so specifically when you say multi drug resistant risk factors antimicrobial therapy in the last 90 days current hospitalization of 5 days or more high frequency of antibiotic resistance in the community or in the specific hospital unit that varies from each hospital to hospital and the hcap i mentioned just now so all the hcap uh, related things are actually more prone for mdr organisms that is hospitalization for 2 days or more in the preceding 90 days residence in nursing home home infusion therapy like iv antibiotics chronic dialysis within 30 days home wound care if any of the family members are suffering from multi drug resistant pathogens or immunosuppressive diseases or immunosuppressive therapies there is no fixed score like how we have pulmonary embolism well score and these scores right there are mentioned scores to not to predict mdr but just to assess the risk factors they are called the alberti score alberti score basically it's a score out of 5 which actually mentions if uh, chronic renal failure for 5 points prior hospitalization 4 points uh 3 points for nursing home basically it just categorizes so score anything more than or equal to 3 uh says more than 30 to 38 to 40% of the people can develop mdr organism it's just a predictive score there's another one called pes score that is pseudomonas aeruginosa enterobacteria ac and uh, mrsa score okay staph aureus score uh this basically don't get scared with this slide this basically i want to show the immune resistance i mean there are a whole lot of cells and uh, in our lining of the uh, uh, alveolar cells or the uh, i mean our lungs that the each of them have such distinctive function all right so there are uh, toll like receptors there are uh, innate uh, cell uh, uh, immunity uh, i mean the bunch of cells then there is a neutrophil ex uh, extracellular traps so which are preventing from any of the uh, organisms to invade our system okay so we are discussing with all these pneumonias once these barriers which are quite good breached and then uh this is happening all right then this basically is mentioned uh to suggest the tissue resilience the tissue uh, resilience basically the endothelial uh, lining is quite tough that it is very uh, well equipped not to uh, allow any of the organisms to enter our lining when do we suspect mdr clinically so like i mentioned previous exposure previous hospitalization previous exposure to cephalosporins or carbaminins patient is at risk of not improving this is an important point patient is admitted we have started a carbapenem and patient is not showing any sign of improvement at least 24 to 48 hours after hospital admission while having said that you need to also uh, need to uh, evaluate why the patient is not responding is it a wrong organism we are dealing with like the mdr is it the wrong diagnosis altogether is it atelectasis pulmonary embolism ards pulmonary hemorrhage underlying neoplasm underlying some other disease which is causing this so we need to keep a very a uh, broad uh, thought process when the patient comes to us then uh, are there any other complications we are dealing with like an empyema or lung abscess or c diff infections occult other infections like mrsa has seeded somewhere else and which is causing it uh, drug fevers all these things all right it's very very important to have a, a high index of suspicion for mdr organisms just an outline uh, of this is not what we normally go through in our uh, care setting as well patient is admitted in the hospital you suspect a pneumonia you send the blood cultures uh, you send the sputum if patient is not intubated you send the sputum culture if patient is intubated you take an endotracheal uh, endotracheal culture or if patient is tracheostomy tracheostomy culture patient is uh, about 48 to 72 hours we reassess right so if the patient is improving so the cultures are uh, negative consider tapering and stopping the antibiotics if the cultures are positive then change the if the patient is improving right so you try and deescalate the antibiotics whichever are sensitive or change them to oral depending on the com 
uh, how sick or uh, this patient is. Usually, our patients don't belong to these categories. Our patients belong to the other categories where they don't show improvement or you know at least the MDR ones. So the culture positive, and then we have to escalate the antibiotics, change the antibiotics to a more narrow spectrum. All right. And if the cultures are negative, then we have to actively look for other organisms or send a fresh set of cultures, lines, uh, or in this line of uh, thought process. Okay. Histopathology, this picture is just to show that uh, left picture is the, it's a H &E staining. Left picture is an early pneumonia. Rightmost is a, uh, a very organized advanced pneumonia. The center one is a viral pneumonia. You can see the uh, neutrophil predominance in the left and right extremes. And you will see the, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, yeah, the predominance in the center image, the lymphocytes in the center image. Just uh, X-ray findings of uh, different ways uh, pneumonia can present. Just an organizing a small patch or an effusion with an, which is the pneumonia is hiding on top or just a para hilar uh, some prominence. Diagnosis. Diagnosis, uh, the left two boxes mainly uh, show that a normal pneumonia diagnosis, like I mentioned. Take the uh, complete blood counts, do your uh, see if uh, leukocytosis is there, how your neutrophils are predominant in the differential count, your CRP, all other parameters, along with specific microbiological things like uh, cultures and especially PCR for any respiratory viruses and MRSS. PCR is essential. Both the ATS and ERS guidelines suggest that we have to send cultures before escalating antibiotics and those things. The right table is where you have to focus. Suppose you are suspecting a MDR bug and you have to confirm. The way to confirm is CARBAR gene testing or BDMAX gene testing. Most of the facilities, at least the tertiary care facilities, have these. Some of the places uh, we work with, usually in a primary and little secondary setups, don't have these. So the CARBAR gene testing basically uh, don't worry about the, all the nomenclature on the right side. I'll just come to them in, in, a, in a short while, in the next slide, actually. KPC, NDM, VIM, IMP, OXA48. Okay, BD max gene testing is also very good. Just that IMP is not there. Otherwise, it detects everything. So if you ask me a question of, okay, we don't have all these facilities. What is the point in knowing about all this? I mean, you have to be aware. So in the facilities we, where this is not available, the next thing is antibiograms. That is where the antibiograms come into a picture. And it is very, very important to maintain an antibiogram in every healthcare setting. Like example, I will tell you, uh, say there is E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia that have resistance to any one carbapenem according to CLSI or UCAS susceptibility. CLSI is your uh, Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute and UCAS is your European Committee on Antibacterial Susceptibility Testing. That's your CLSI and UCAS. They set a guideline saying this is the cutoff limits. So this resistance we have to carbapenem, we have found it. So moment you know that there is resistance to this and uh, more than that, we know for a fact that there is some MDR growing on, going on there. Then coming to uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Acinetobacter with resistance to penicillin or cephalosporins or carbapenem with susceptibility to astinum. Why I mentioned this susceptibility to astinum is next slide. I will tell there is MBL suspects. Okay. What is MBL is a metallo beta lactamases. I will just come to the classification of beta lactamases, then we'll get a better picture. I'll just tell again. Places where we don't have the gene testing facilities, the only way to go forward is the antibiograms. If at least, like I, that is why you should know the definition of MDR. At least one drug of each class resistant fits into MDR. Three classes. So it's, uh, just uh, don't have to remember anything. Just a beta lactamases classification. This is important because beta lactamases are classified into non metallo uh, beta lactamases or the serine beta lactamases and the metallo beta lactamases so the the yellow one you see here the uh, metallo beta lactamases so those basically uh, what it means is that uh, they are susceptible to astronom okay the mbl so that is why this this classification is important and the non metallo or the serine beta lactamases are class a c and d all right. This is basically the molecular classification and the below one, what they're showing the Bush and Jacobi is a functional classification based on uh, what they're attached to. 
now coming to the treatment options so this debate of should i give one drug to this multi drug resistant organism or should i give more than one drug i mean which each of us have our own experience and which of us have reviewed our own literature and uh, whatever the scenarios throw at us we decide okay i think this previous history i faced this issue so i am going to add more than one so do we have like a concrete evidence let us go through also to uh, go through uh, pre, uh, i mean for selecting monotherapy there are a whole lot of situations like i was mentioning the hospital parameters so mic is well below within the breaking point so i'll use it there's no concomitant infections or co-infection so i'll use a single drug there's no extreme bacterial load so i'll use a single drug or there are pathogen parameters pathogen parameters like availability of therapeutic drug monitoring availability of uh, adverse effects i don't know how to manage or uh, this dosing is adequate or not so i don't want to give a second drug i'll give first drug then the experience with the mdr xdr alone then the antibiotic parameters the pkpd availability the risk factors for resistance in that particular setting patient parameters the cost uh, a patient is not in septic shock localized infection antimyogram lack of severe other comorbidities so basically for whatever reason we tend to choose monotherapy sometimes this is just one word on merino trial the idea is there is a ceftriaxone resistance so they want to choose if uh peptas peprosilin and tazobactam versus meropenem will it be beneficial the outcome was peprosilin tazobactam was was not at all superior to meropenem i mean this is a very uh, important trial why i thought to mention was where you are suspecting uh mdrs are there and you think peptas patient is not doing okay it is completely all right to escalate the antibiotics right at the beginning when you when you see a sick patient and uh, so i've told about monotherapy and uh, combination therapy so there are two uh, landmark uh, studies which i want to mention at this point one is the lancet i think this published in 2018 it's an open label uh, randomized controlled trial what they've studied in this is colistin versus colistin along with meropenem in treating of carbapenem resistant uh, gram negative bacteria so uh, cutting to the chase the interpretation of this is combination therapy was not superior to monotherapy in fact this and this is particularly studied in acinetobacter alone acinetobacter they've clearly mentioned that uh, uh, the combination therapy is definitely not superior to monotherapy so that's why in acinetobacter you can give colistin alone a similar study in 2022 actually in december first week it was published nejm very fairly recent uh, uh, publication so this also studied colistin monotherapy versus combination therapy for carbapenem resistant organisms so this also concluded that combination therapy with colistin and meropenem is not superior to colistin monotherapy for the treatment of pneumonia or bsi uh, caused by these pathogens the mdr pathogens we are discussing about right so this uh, this is called the overcome trial <clears throat> it's a it's a fairly uh, large trial yeah it's a it's a double blinded placebo control trial okay so coming to the the main chunk what are we dealing with mdr organisms we come across vre you need to get uh, used to this terminology vres mrsa visa vrsa carab these are all accepted terminologies crpsa crkb cre vre is uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus mrsa methicillin resistant uh, staphylococcus aureus vancomycin intermittent sensitive uh, staphylococcus aureus vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus that is visa and vrsa c diff i am not going to discuss in detail crab uh, this is basically carbapenem resistant acinetobacter bomini uh, carbapenem resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa carbapenem resistant klebsiella pneumonia carbapenem resistant uh, e coli all right so let's discuss with these set of organisms the gram negative these are more common than the gram positive we come across these every day in our setting acinetobacter pseudomonas okay so it's a question for the audience the drugs used to treat esbl include so we discussed esbl what is esbl excited spectrum beta lactamase okay what are the drugs used to treat esbl anybody wants to volunteer meropenem and colistin okay so uh i will so that your option is option one right some carbapenems so we'll discuss this so carbapenems definitely we know that they are the drug of choice 
but you should also remember that i mentioned that uh, third generation cephalosporins are uh, resistant but there are other generation fifth generation cephalosporins which are actually used for esbl that is the cefamycins there are the cefotetan and cefoxetin and also i mentioned piperacillin alone is resistant so that's why we add tazobactam so that's why they are beta lactamase inhibitors along with the inhibitor combination those also can be used. So the third is also a drug of choice. But if you are, if you ask me, sorry, not drug of choice. If you ask me, which is a specific drug for ESBL, it is carbapenems. But can these be used? Yes, one, two, three can be used for ESBLs. Ceftazidim is not. All right, ceftazidim it is actually resistant to MDR organisms. So these are all the. Uh, we have these instruments at our disposal. So those are these antibiotics, polymyxins, phosphomycin, TG, cyclin, ceftazidim, mevolactam, astrinum. These are the ones which we commonly use. The left side, the not so newer ones which are available in European countries and uh, 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 states, but not in India yet, are meropenem, vaborbactam, imipenem, silastatin with uh, relibactam, ervacycline, cefidercol, ceftralazone, and tazobactam. These are, I mean, one or two drugs, I think, have come to India, but uh, it's not av freely available. The left ones is what we commonly across. Polymyxins, the cholestin, uh, which is also called the polymyxin E and the polymyxin B. So I'll just outline, touch on each of the drugs, their mechanism of action briefly, and what dosages we should give, and outline side effects wherever they are necessary. And next, I will come to our organisms, what we deal with MDR, and which are the preferred regimens. There are extensive tables. I try to condense as much as I can because if you actually look up, a lot of articles present these really big tables. Okay, cholestin. It's a pro drug form, and the bolus dosing is nine to twelve million units, and the further uh, continuation dose is four point five million units PD. If the patient is on CRRT, actually the dose should be higher. That should be 4.5 million units TID because the CRRT filter actually absorbs a lot of cholestin. That is why you have to overdose patients on CRRT. And uh, you will mention creat clearance, right? I mean, based on creat clearance, you adjust the dose 1 million units BD or 2 million units BD. But how do we actually calculate that? Because it's given in million units. If you actually see on the, uh, the drug box, it gives in milligrams, mil international units. But we have to calculate based on the milligram because create clearance they will give based on milligram so here i'll just uh, tell you remember that one milligram of cholestin base unit that is a cba is equal to thirty thousand units so if a create clearance is more than 50 that means you have to give 300 milligram that essentially means 300 into 30,000. that's 9 million units and subsequently you calculate if depending on the create clearance that much milligram into thirty thousand. that will essentially give you how much uh, international units you have to give it is nephrotoxic uh, as contrary to uh, polymyxin B, it is much more nephrotoxic. Okay, coming to polymyxin B, uh, it's an active drug, 15 lakh international units IV is the uh, stat dosing, 7.5 lakh uh, units IV is the BD dosing. There is no dose adjustment for renal failure and it is usually not used for renal infections because it does not concentrate well in kidneys. So when something is not going to the kidneys, what is the point in giving, right? So it is not excreted by kidneys. It is not getting concentrated in the kidneys. So it is not used to treat urinary tract infections. Okay. It is less nephrotoxic as compared to uh, polymyxin E. Coming to phosphomycin. Uh, so one more thing I want to mention is uh, how does uh, cholestin act? Cholestin is a detergent. I mean, it is li acts like a detergent. It creates pores on the cell wall and that is how it kills the bacteria. Okay. Coming to the uh, phosphomycin. Phosphomycin basically is an analog of uh, PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate. Uh, it interferes with the formation of uh, N-acetylmuramic acid. N-acetylmuramic acid is the building block. It's the brick of cell wall. Okay, you destroy that, and the organism crumbles. The dosage is 12 to 24 milligram. Uh, sorry, 12 to 24 gram per day in two to four divide doses. It's used in bacteremias, meningitis, osteomyelitis, pneumonias, UTI, etc. Usually, it is used in combination. Common side effects are hypokalemia, but a lot of literature don't suggest hypernatremia as a side effect. But 
we come across a lot of hypernatremia bedside if you work with phosphomycin you will know this hypernatremia is quite common with phosphomycin tg cycling tg cycling is a glycyl uh, cycling it's uh, bound to 30s it's used for cre and crab okay and not usually for the pseudomonas carbapenem resistant pseudomonas the stat dosing a uh, lot of people use 100 mg with iv uh, stat and 50 mg bd but when uh, people when uh, consultants are using as a monotherapy some tend to give 200 mg stat and 100 mg bd that's also fairly okay uh, and uh, there is no dose adjustment only there's dose adjustment in liver dysfunction if it is child c right so child c also you are stat dosing will be 100 mg and uh, uh, 25 mg uh, hello 25 mg twice daily all right so you have to decide if it's a monotherapy you are looking for or a combination therapy and you want to use it as a first choice drug or an alter alternate choice drug it is definitely a good choice for as an initial therapy for skin and soft tissue infections whereas an alternative therapy for community acquired pneumonia pneumonias and intra abdominal infections right this is our favorite drug ceftazidim avibactim ceftazidim avibactim uh, it's a uh, one point i meant forgot to mention digicycline is it's not a very drug good drug because it is a bacteriostatic drug okay and uh, bacteriostatic drugs are not very good for bacteremias when there's an active infection going on i want a bactericidal drug and not a bacteriostatic drug okay and it should not be used to treat infections because same reason like before i mentioned it does not like uh, it does not uh, go to the uh, kidney it doesn't concentrate in the kidneys so it is not good for uh, treating UTIs. Ceftazidim avibactum. Ceftazidim avibactum, it's a bactericidal drug. It is mediated through binding to essential penciling binding proteins. So here what uh, avibactum does is it's a non-beta lactamase inhibitor. So I was talking like BLI, beta lactamase inhibitor. So avibactum actually uh, does what it, it, ma it makes ceftazidim more available. Okay. It prevents the beta lactamases from deg degrading the ceftazidim. That is why avibactum is, is good. It's a BLI. Okay, it's active against class A and class D. That's your KPC and OXA and not class B. Class B, I've mentioned, if you remember before, they are metallo beta lactamases. That is, uh, the other ones are class A, C, and D are serine uh, beta lactamases. Class B is a metallo beta lactamase and ceftazidim avibactum will not work in them. Astronom is the drug of choice for them. I will get to there in a short while. Uh, dose for ceftazidim avibactum is 2.5 gram IV atharly. And the dose reduction renal failure is 1.25 gram IV atharly. Some even depending on creat clearance can give it as BD as well. Other drugs which, uh, uh, which are available, I mean, not here outside, but uh, you need to have an idea. And uh, very specific points about them is meropenem and vaborbactam it is useful in class a cre only all right so class a cre is basically against only e coli and maybe klebsiella but not for pseudomonas not for other organisms definitely not for pseudomonas ceftalazine and tazobactam it is definitely for pseudomonas and not for e coli okay and aerocycline is for uh, acinetobacter, but not for pseudomonas or burkholderia. I know it may sound a little too much, though, that so many antibiotics, which organism I have to remember, but these are extremely important because we are at MDR. We don't want to go to XDR and PDR. When we get to PDR, we, we have nothing to save us. So it's very, very essential to know and be aware of MDRs and treat them appropriately with appropriate antibiotics so loose use of antibiotics actually is extremely harm harmful going forward then uh, not so favorite but important drugs aminoglycosides they have potential nephrotoxicity uh, they don't concentrate really well in the lungs they have increased resistance rates and can be used in most mdrs one drug I would particularly like to mention is plasomycin. It's more active against uh, CRE uh, more than uh, CRPA and CRAB. 
कि इट डजेंट रियली रीच लंग कॉन्सेंट्रेशन सो इट्स नॉट वेरी गुड फॉर निमोनियस so now i will just discuss in the next few slides few slides which are the preferred regimens so when we are talking about uh, uh, in serine carbapenems that is basically kpcs or oxa 48 we, these we get in our cultures right kpc or oxa 48 the choice one will be our ceftazidim avibactam if you don't have ceftazidim avibactam or you can't give for whatever reason we really don't have a choice because then we have to really jump to uh, choice two So choice one, we don't have available other choices in India. Choice two will be your polymyxin, uh, polymyxins with meropenem. That is basically if MIC is less than eight. That's why checking MIC, that is minimum inhibitory concentration, is extremely important. All right. The alternative for uh, if MIC is not eight, or if it is more, or if there is GI or lung, uh, we are uh, we are treating, then your polymyxin with TG cycline is a good combination. If it is CRE, polymyxin with ervacycline. These are these are good combinations. Coming to your MBL, like I mentioned before, MBLs are metal or beta lactamases. This astyonam based therapy is 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 the only way. So you have to have astyonam with ceftazidimabactam or astyonam with uh, cefidurocol. Usually it is not available, so we go to the choice two: polymyxin with meropenem, polymyxin with tigacycline, polymyxin with ervacycline. Ervacycline is also not available. crab this is uh, carbapenem uh, resistant acinetobacter baumeni in this the really the choice between is a monotherapy or a combination therapy that's fairly okay we have discussed the lancet article we have discussed the uh, uh, njm article as well so it's not superior combination therapy is definitely not superior so you can give polymyxin versus polymyxin or tigacycline or polymyxin with combination of minocycline or combination with carbapenems or in fact rifampicin as well for uh, crpsa the pseudomonas polymyxin if no other drugs are available actually this is uh, i mean uh, uh, us literature says they can they don't use polymyxin right away they use other drugs for us in, in, in our indian scenario polymyxin is the way for this so coming to the i finished mdr gram negative organisms very short discussion about mdr gram positive organism we see vre uh, vrsa mrsa all right so mrsa it is i put uh, treat the source treatment of source in red i mean does that mean all other organisms we don't treat the source no it is extremely important to treat every organism the source and even more important for mrsa because mrsa uh, uh, it seeds there is metastatic mrsa that is basically it can go into skin it can go into vertebrae it can go into fat tissue adipose tissue it can go into uh, uh, your vert uh, vertebral uh, uh, soft tissues muscle it can seed and it can always come back so it's extremely important to treat uh, mrsa promptly and uh, with appropriate antibiotics and after 3 days also your bacterial culture is positive for mrsa that's not a very good prognosis that means it has already seeded somewhere and it is throwing flush, uh, bacteremia of mrsa everywhere okay and vancomycin is a drug of choice for mrsa that is if your mic is less than 1 microgram per ml vancomycin alternate drug is your daptomycin If it is more than or equal to one, daptomycin is your preferred drug over vancomycin. And if it is more than two, definitely daptomycin. So, uh, vancomycin uh, nephrotoxic, but fairly all right. I mean, we we use vancomycin pretty commonly for all the line related stuff and meningitis. Meningitis dose is slightly higher, one gram TID. Otherwise, one gram BD is a full dose, and renal adjustment based on uh, the nephrotoxicity. Redman syndrome is a described thing, but uh, I'm not sure how many have actually come across Redman syndrome in Indian scenario. Ticoplanin, ticoplanin is uh, less nephrotoxic as compared to vancomycin. It is better tolerated. Dosing is six to twelve milligram per kg IV OD, and it is a better drug for lung infections. Daptomycin, it is not used in lung infections, and uh, 
that's basically not for VRSA, MRSA pneumonias because it daptomycin is in fact inactivated by a surfactant. So because the surfactant inactivates it, it does not have any effect on the pneumonias, especially the VRSA, MRSA. Common known side effects are myopathy. So that's why if patient complains of muscle cramps, muscle pains after starting, starting daptomycin, you have to be aware and check the CPK levels. And is, uh, on the other hand, if the patient does not have pneumonia, you're treating uh, dapto giving daptomycin for any other infection, but develop some respiratory illness in the next three or four days after starting antibiotic, you have to keep isnophilic pneumonia in mind. Dosing is 6 to 10 milligram per kg IVOD. It's usually available in doses of 350 milligram per vial. All right. So uh, one more thing about uh, ticoplanin is the dosing I've mentioned 6 to 12 milligram, right? So we give 400 milligram, uh, three doses every 12 hourly, subsequently 400 milligram OD. Uh, okay. This, this drug is a very interesting drug. It is the first drug which is patented by India. And it is called levonorgestrel. It I'm not sure if it is FDA approved yet. It is definitely uh, DGCI approved. It is basically Indian drug. That's why. And uh, the actual drug is levonorgestrel, and the prodrug is Elali Nida defloxacin. It is formulated for IV and oral formulations. It's a gram positive drug. It's a quinolone basically. Uh, <laughs> its mechanism of action is. Uh, DNA gyrase, just like quinolones. It's a good choice for MRSA, VISA, VRSA. Uh, usually uh, used for a skin and uh, soft tissue infections. It does not have dose adjustment in hepatic or renal impairments. Dosage orally is uh, 1000 milligram. It comes as a 500 milligram tablet, so two tablets. And uh, 800 milligram, 12th hourly if it is IV. So VRSA. VRSA, the bacteremia with source control and uh, proven, uh, yeah, this is very important. When you should use monotherapy and when you should use combination therapy. So the monotherapy, you have to prove that there is no deep-seated infection. If there is no deep-seated VRSA, then your monotherapy is fine. You can give uh, a single drug. On the other hand, you have a deep-seated concomitant infection going on elsewhere. You have to treat with combination therapy. That will be your daptomycin with ceftrolin or vancomycin with ceftrolin or daptomycin trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. That is your Bactrim DS or uh, ceftrolin with uh, Bactrim DS. VRE, that is basically both ampicillin and vancomycin resistance. In this, uh, we give uh, daptomycin as a drug of choice or lenozolid. And our setup, we usually use lenozolid. Or there is another school of thought which says that we will give ampicillin in a combination of sulbactam at a very high dose. So you are giving at a dose of 18 to 30 gram per day. That's almost 3 gram IV 4 hourly. All right. That is ampicillin resistance. You give ampicillin with sulbactam combination at a very high dose or daptomycin or lenozolid. Okay, so I mean, when do you optimize antibiotic? This is very, very important that we make the right diagnosis. We send the adequate cultures and we start empirical therapy and as soon as possible, get down to the narrow therapy. As soon as possible, de-escalate the antibiotics. As soon as possible, change from IV to oral. These are all very, very, very critical decisions. All right. And the most important thing which we usually ignore is let the antibiotics go on for a long time. Usually, antibiotics are 7 to 10 days are good and particular scenarios, pyelonephritis and one or two other scenarios where goes up to 14 to 21 days. But usually, most we, we should be okay with 7 to 10 days antibiotics. We have to start considering as soon as possible patient is better, try and take them down, taper them, change them. So coming to the summary, ESBLs, the drug of choice is carbapenem. Recognized by testing ESBL gene, if at least by looking at your antibiograms, if it is resistant to at least one generation, I mean, uh, third generation cephalosporin, then we know it is ESBL. MDR, if uh, uh, depending on what species and what source, if it is combination therapy, monotherapy, we have discussed this. So MDR, like I said, if you have gene testing, go for carbar gene or BD max testing. If that is not available, then you know antibiograms are the way forward. 
So antibiograms, how we usually make out is like I mentioned, if it is resistant to carbapenems for all practical purposes, it is an ESBL producer <coughs> and it is likely resistance to quinolones also. So that gives you three classes, which, which means they are MDR and uh, <coughs> all MDRs are not same. Like I mentioned, you have to see which species you're dealing with, which source and should we give a single drug like in uh, CRAB where you can okay with giving cholestin alone or uh, other combination drugs in other organisms. Then the gram positive infections, they are not so common, but yes, we do come across them. And uh, we have discussed the combination drugs. And uh, best practices or how do we come uh, bring down the MDR? It is a collective effort. It is a collective effort from scientists, policymakers, health workers, and individual people that they should not uh, uh, irrationally use the drugs and very cautious prescriptions and uh, hand hygiene practices in the care settings and and these are all extremely important okay thank you i'm done any questions i know it's a slightly longish class but i try to condense as much as i can hey i have a question <clears throat> hi hi dr Samish. So, yes. This is with respect to uh, what you said about uh, bacteriostatic and uh, bactericidal drugs. Right. And I, I think in a patient who is immunocompetent, yes, there should not be any difference in efficacy between a bacteriostatic drug and a bactericidal drug as long as the bug is sensitive. Uh, so Agreed. the, only, the only, only time when you should be worried about a bacteriostatic drug not being as effective is in severely neutropenic patients or severely immunocompromised patients. So apart from that, for every other patient, I don't think there is a big difference between a bacteriostatic and a bactericidal drug. Okay. From, from just, just say that from my understanding, when there is a bacteremia, I mean, uh, however, the, uh, uh, the, the patient baseline condition is, if there is an extended bacteremia, I mean, microbiologically, I, uh, yeah. Dr. Sanu? Well, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, depending on the bacteremia is going on. So, I thought the understanding was bactericidal would be a better choice as compared to bacteriostatic. But I could be wrong. I will just cross check on that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it, it, it kind of depends on what you're really dealing with. Severe sepsis, you need to basically get a hold of the cells response quickly and there is a, a florid bacteremia like Prudhvi mentioned a bactericidal drug will always give you better bang for the buck and uh, routine infections say you have a community acquired pneumonia patient is stable immunocompetent like Sandesh mentioned it re shouldn't really matter what uh, you know whether you're using a bacteriostatic or a bactericidal drug and again weak bacteriostatic drugs will never be as good as bacteriostatic drugs uh, but excellent bacteriostatic for example linozolid is a bacteriostatic drug but has excellent activity against mrsa and cure rate for skin infections is almost as high as 90 95 percent whereas you uh, use colistin for example even though it sounds like a fancy drug uh, the actually it's, it's a bacteriostatic drug and uh, the clearance rates are much much lower so it depends on what you're dealing with and also how good a bacteriostatic drug it is to start with and how much bacteremia is there. But in principle, in studies so far, the original theory that you should never use a bacteriostatic drug alone or even there is this another school of thought that if you should not use a bacteriostatic and a bactericidal drug alone because uh, the vestigial drugs act against fast multiplying organisms. These theories haven't really been proven in any studies so far. They've been looking at it for decades. Uh, so uh, one probably should just use his or her, her judgment to you know, uh, treat patients. Yeah, hey, uh, Prithvi Dilip here. A really good lecture Hi. to kick off the new year. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, this Siddle this, uh, versus static seems to be like a um uh, perennial debate but essentially we've discussed this before uh, as well in the group maybe a couple of years ago uh, data is very sparse on this and it looks like 
it has all the characteristics of a potential myth in the making where uh, perhaps static and still don't have much of a difference the re main reason being it seems like it's a spectrum so for example if you have mssa conjunctivitis and in the conjunctivitis you are sensitive to ciprofloxacin i mean sorry resistant the culture is resistant eye drops of ciprofloxacin tend to work because the concentration is about a thousand fold higher in the eye drops when compared to a tablet so sidl versus static is also dependent on the dose actually so a lower dose can be static and a higher dose can be sidl and again like uh, sandesh was mentioning when you have a competent immune system it probably doesn't matter and i'm i might go as far to say that even in a weakened immune system depending on the dose the drugs can be more or less effective uh, dose penetration site of infection things that sanu was pointing out so i think sidl versus static is a arbitrary microbiological definition um that may not have clinical relevance in the sense that you found it on the petri dish at a certain specific concentration but if you change the concentration or you change the characteristics of the uh, bacteria or the characteristics of the host it just becomes irrelevant so i think that sidl versus static is is just one sort of a number that is derived from the petri dish and perhaps clinical relevance uh, relevance is yet to be determined because sanu gave the example of soft tissue with uh, um linezolid in fact pneumonia cure rates in studies uh, also are essentially identical uh, to uh, vancomycin and this is uh, by a study done in uh, the clinical infectious disease by wondering at all it's it's equivocal so i i don't hold much to this in fact if you look at tuberculosis drugs as well many of them are static not sidl so is. we we don't know and and if 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 i find that there is clinical equipoise and there are studies to prove that a drug works i don't let sidl versus static affect my judgment although it's a good to know from a microbiology perspective um i don't know if it's a must to know right Nice, nice point. Yeah. Yeah. One more uh, uh, point I just wanted to touch upon with you was the debate on levonorgestrel. It's been a new kid on the block, and pharma has been peddling it extensively in this country for I think close to two years now. Okay. But it, yeah, I've looked at the data. Uh, yet to see anything impressive. Almost all studies are non-inferiority trials. done against linezolid and other uh, medicines yes. and all the pro other problems even though you know there's this dna gyrase effect all the other problems that exist with uh, rather quinolones quinolones rates we really don't know if the same holds good for levonorgestrel so until further data comes or or somebody does a proper rct and uh, gives us uh, you know some actionable data i, I wouldn't really use this drug right now it it's kind of looking uh, like a pharma driven thing yes yeah i agree with sanu i i would put uh, ferropenem edta all of that in the same bucket until further i mean i don't believe that you need fda clearance that's not what i'm saying because domperidone is not fda cleared but you know there's plenty of data for it so perhaps similarly ferropenem edta based therapies and this uh, very hard to pronounce quinolone can be put in the same bucket <laughs> yeah that is that's true yeah there is uh, there is not much literature published on this actually i mean there are studies but uh, nothing i mean right now i think it is a lot of skin and soft tissue infections thank you thank you sanu any other questions uh, no thanks a lot no, thank none you. from my side thank you thank you